So just to give me the, the uh, okay, I think. Five minutes? Yes, five minutes. Five minutes. Oh, what do you think? Can we start or not? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Hello? Yeah. Okay. Good morning. Buenos dias. For, for the Spanish people. Okay, um, I'm Loredana Di Lucchio. I have the honor to moderate this uh, last but not least, of course, uh, keynote speech uh, of Professor Birgit Marga. Um, it's an honor because, uh, okay, as you see, the topic is about service design. Uh, maybe what I can say that uh, service design start with her because <laughs> in 1995 uh, she has been the first professor in the academic fields that teach in a course titled service design and uh, she has been also the founder of the uh, uh, des service design network together with the other people but she is one of the founder and uh, the first maybe paper that you've written is, was in 1998, seventh, okay. And so in 2008, uh, the, in the design, uh, um, service design network, they start to organize a global conferences dedicated to this topic. And what is important, uh, according to my personal point of view, is this uh, speech. Uh, with this very interesting title, is exactly under the meaning of these conferences, or the main topic of these conferences, because service design maybe is uh, one of the most powerful way for design to change the world, to transform the world, to transform what we are and what we can do. So I don't want to lose your time and leave the stage to Professor uh, Birgit Mark. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for this really nice um, introduction and uh, nice to see you. I was afraid that everybody would be at the beach now, um, but uh, obviously I have uh, 60 minutes of your time, uh, even though we have sunshine. Who of you has studied service design? Please get up. Stand up. Just I want to see who studied service design. Okay. Okay. Sit down. Who has never heard of service design. Stand up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's a challenge. How am I going to entertain you all? Well, I will try. I will try very hard to give those of you who have not yet heard about service design a basic understanding of what it is and to also inspire maybe those of you who have already studied service design and maybe even working as service designers. So let's see how that goes. The public sector. The public sector all over the world is facing huge challenges of transformation. And the public sector is the biggest service provider worldwide. It has the most employees of all companies in the world. So many people work for the public sector and they are all facing a challenge of change. You know what it is about, no matter where you come from. If you come from Chile, Mexico, Italy, Germany, UK, Great Britain, USA, everywhere. The public sector has to build better educational systems. The public sector has to make sure that the health systems work in the most innovative way and can still be financed. The public sector has to take care of infrastructure and has to make sure that our infrastructure is, is working and um, innovated constantly. I could go on and on and on. The challenges are huge. Um, last but not least, the whole challenge of digitalization. And some countries are doing better, some are doing worse, but all of them are facing the challenge of, let's say, doing less with more, or doing more with less. 
So the expectations that um, citizens have towards the public sector are growing and uh, the resources are usually rather limited. It can be the financial resources, uh, but it's mainly also people. Uh, the public sector would need the best employees, the most advanced engineers, digitalists, designer, etc. But what is the payment like in the public sector? Uh, some of you might know, it's not the most attractive one. So the public sector has to do more with less, with less resources, and has to make sure to attract the best employees in order to tackle these challenges. So this is a, a quote by Dan Hill. By the way, if you are in the design field, I can strongly recommend that book, Dark Matters and Trojan Horses. Uh, it's super, super interesting. He said that more broadly, public administration was invented to provide security, stability, and certainty after all. So they were not made for change. They were not created for transformation. They were created to keep things as they are under control in a stable way. That is a, is a big gap between the challenges facing to make things different, to make them better, to innovate, and the structures of public sector were made for stability. So what has service design to do with all of this? Mm, service design is a rather, rather new field in design, which does, to say it plainly, design services through the lens of the user and other stakeholders aiming at making service experiences valuable, uh, accessible, um, and impactful, and pleasant. So what does that have to do with the public sector? Another author that I can strongly recommend if you are interested in service design and the public sector is uh, Christian Basin from uh, Denmark. He's leading the Danish Design Center. And he said, design on the other hand, uh, on the one hand, an institutional and governance context on the other can be viewed as two waves crashing against each other, resulting in unpredictable ripple effects. Imagine the admittedly somewhat cliched, creative, fast-paced culture of designers as it meets the equally cliched, old-fashioned bureaucracy, bureaucratic culture of civil servants. Although both descriptions are stereotypes, there is no doubt that the professionals who typically occupy the two domains have very different views of and appetites for innovation of change. If you are in the design domain, you think change is natural. You are constantly thinking, how can we make things better? How can we make them easier? How can we make them more sustainable? If you are in the public sector, you were not educated to think about change and making things better and different all the time. So there is cultural differences that are quite strong. But what, uh, what would that mean? Uh, I have made a little experiment uh, with the PhD students of Sapienza University in Rome who are studying in the, in the field of service design and public sector. I have asked them to do a semantic differential. Not sure if everybody knows that. It's an, uh, easygoing research technique uh, where you ask people to uh, scale a specific topic on a scale between, let's say, old and young, happy and, uh, and um, dull, uh, etc. And um, I asked the students of the PhD program to do that, and this is what came out in the comparison of how public sector and service design are creating associations. What do you, you know, associate with the public sector? It's more like old-fashioned, heavy, dark, slow, and maybe more ugly than pretty. And service design is more young, bright, fast, and uh, pretty. So there are huge differences, and you could think that this will not go together. But ever since I have been teaching service design, and indeed it was 1995 when I started, uh, the public sector was one of the most interesting partners that I have been working with. And nowadays, uh, you can see that all over the world, the public sector is embracing service design, even though there are huge cultural differences. But maybe it is those differences that create the energy that makes transformation possible. Maybe it's really two worlds meeting that are able to create something very new. Now, some of you might know this example, but uh, since many of you are new to the field of service design, I would like to share it. It's a project that I did with the students from my university 
uh, at uh, the Köln International School of Design in Cologne, Germany in the year 1997. And I gave them a challenge for a six week project and the challenge was create innovative services for homeless people. As simple as that. And the students at that time, I mean, service design was super new and many of the, the terms and methods that we have today did not yet exist, but the students took a designerly approach to this challenge and they started to take the deep dive. They understood what are the facts and figures around uh, homelessness in Cologne, who are the stakeholders, the people that are dealing with homelessness in the, in the public administration and maybe in the social service domain. Um, what are the facts and figures, the numbers that we can extract from that? And most important of all, who are these people that are in homelessness? And you can imagine that that was quite a, a big step to take to get out of the comfort zone of sitting um, in, your, in your classroom or workshop room to going out on the street, doing observational studies, um, doing uh, contextual interviews, which means you spend time with a person, just the person doing what they would do anyway. And you would ask, why are you doing what you are doing? What are you doing right now? Uh, is that how you like to do it? What would you do differently if you could? Et cetera, et cetera. So contextual interviews, stepping into the context of someone's life and trying to understand how are things working or not working. Um, so the students did a lot of discovery, trying to understand what the situation around homelessness is. We call it today the exploration of the system. And they came up with findings that were quite interesting. We have different types of homelessness, voluntary, non-voluntary, short-term, long-term, with drug abuse, without drug abuse, so different personas, as we would say today. But all these personas have one thing in common, and that is the loss of dignity when you are in homelessness. It is very difficult to live a dignified life if you don't have, have access to the most basic things that a home provides to us. So the students decided that in this six week project, they wanted to create a service that allows a dignified survival in homelessness. Um, so they started to ideate. And that's about the same as in every design process. You start to develop ideas. You do not just stick with the first idea you have, you try to you know, push it really far, far. They started to work together with the stakeholders in the public administration. And they started to work together with the homeless people in order to come up with ideas on how to create a dignified life in homelessness. And they built prototypes. They created little mock-ups of what could that look like. And this is, of course, hard to identify, but it is mailboxes. That is a photo from 1996, so maybe seven uh, mailboxes that give the homeless people a permanent address. Or, or let's say an address for the time that they are in homelessness. And that is so important. If you don't have an address, you don't exist. So now they had, from what's the idea, an address to be in touch with the administration, with potential landlords, with potential employers. Um, and uh, that would give kind of like a yeah, normality to life. The students came up with uh, ideas uh, together with the stakeholders on having a tiny little um, medical service uh, that would uh, treat minor injuries so that these minor injuries would not become major problems uh, through the living circumstances of dirt and everything. They created lots and lots of different uh, um, services around personal hygiene. And that for the homeless people was one of the most important things because if you cannot use even a bathroom, um, it is very, very, you know, undignifying. Um, and that was the most important thing from the student perspective, that is the reception. And the reception is the symbol for this being a service and the homeless people are guests for that service. And that was a really interesting conversation that then started because the homeless people said, well, what if we would even pay a little bit of money and we would not be guests, but we would be customers. And as customers, we would have right and expectation to get a specific quality of service. So those conversations happened and um, 
in the end, after the six weeks, this was the prototype that was presented to the city of Cologne, to the social services, to the, um, to the homeless people. And behind that prototype of a physical space was the concept of a service that the homeless people would pay minor amounts of money, but that would also provide jobs. So it is a service run by homeless people for homeless people. And it was so interesting that everybody in the room was then unanimously enthusiastic and said, let's do it. Um, and uh, often, you know, you have discussion and conversation and nothing gets done in the end. But seeing this and hearing the story behind it, not only the, the public administrators, but also the social service providers, and in the end also the citizens of Cologne took the energy to make it happen. And this is it. In the year 2000, it was ready. Um, and it became more than we had planned in that six-week project. This is the cafe, and it is run by homeless people for homeless people. I have worked there in the year for 2019 uh, for several months on one Sunday per month just to see how are things going. Are there maybe opportunities for change? <laughs> And it was very, very impressive to see how these people run a cafe. They do the shopping, they do the cleaning, they do the cooking, they do the service, they do the finance. Everything is run by homeless people. In the whole place of Gulliver, there is only one social worker who is there to help the homeless people who work there because it is, of course, sometimes a clash of roles when you are a customer yourself and you are working there. So this is the laundry room. Um, and you see it's not pretty, it's not beautified, prettified, but this is why I like this project so much. It clarifies that design is not about beautification of nonsense. Design is about solving real world problems in a way that it works for those people it is addressing. And it works. At Gulliver there has never been any vandalism and we are talking now about 23 years. Um, the people respect the place and uh, they use it and keep it as it is. This is day beds to have a, a protected area during the daytime uh, when, you know, in, on the street you're always a bit tense and afraid that things might happen. This was the very first computer that was ever installed at Gulliver many years ago. Um, but now there is a modern computer so that uh, the homeless have also access to their virt virtual uh, existence. They have websites, they have email, email addresses and everything. So. That's the interesting thing that Gulliver is also a service design project in the sense that it, it is continuously learning because as a service designer, you are never done. If you design a chair, at some point you give it to the production and the marketing, it's done. If you design a service, it needs continuous improvement because the expectations of people change, the opportunities through technology change, um, and other circumstances might change and opportunities might open. This is a photo of um, the lockers that have been installed at Gulliver, I think in 2018. And it is an outcome of a project that is permanently run with the homeless people to see what else could we do, what do we need. And the homeless said, it's, it's really stupid if you have to run through the city with your bags and your rucksack. Uh, it would be really lovely if we could park it somewhere, and not only for an hour or two, but maybe for two or three weeks, that at least our our backpack has a home and we can, you know, just change the things we need on a daily basis and are not identified as homeless people immediately through the fact that we are wearing plastic bags with our belongings. And this is a very bad photo I took while I was working there. Um, I hate to take photos there. Um, and it's a, it's a charging station for all the, the digital devices. And of course, all the homeless people have phones, they have tablets, whatsoever. Uh, but how do you charge them in public space? You, know, you have to have an eye on it all the time. Uh, so they, they came up with this idea of a charging station that has a safe place for your digital devices. So this is what Gulliver is about. Um, and it's, this is a movie the Korean television took. They did a, a feature about social service design and they visited a couple of the projects that I did. So just so you get an idea, it's, it's a rough place, it's a rough environment, uh, but uh, I go there once in a while to have a coffee. It's really easy, it's a also sunny and nice place. Some artists do exhibitions there, uh, so to make this not an exclusive place only for homeless people, but a part of the city. Yeah, so um, 
So that was uh, the very first project I ever did in the domain of service design together with the students. And I'm very lucky that it was implemented and that it still lives today. Um, because when you are new to a field, people want proof of the pudding. And the proof of the pudding is in its eating. You have to make things happen. And so I was really fortunate that with this project, at the very early times of service design, we were able to show the value of the approach, designing services. So this is just, uh, there is this definition, choreographed processes, technologies, and interactions within complex systems um, in order to create value for relevant stoke stakeholders. And I would like to underline the complex systems. When you design services, you are working within living systems, organizations that have their own dynamics, that are interrelated. You change one thing, suddenly something else will be impacted by that. It's people. Um, and uh, you have to be aware as a designer that you cannot control complex systems. Again, coming back to the chair, um, the material of a chair, you have to practice, practice, but you can design it. You can control the material. You cannot control an organization. but you can influence it, you can monitor it, you can you know, support it, and um, co-create value for relevant stakeholders. So it's not only about the end user. If the employee of an organization does not like what they are doing, how will the quality of service be? If other stakeholders you need in order to keep the system running are not standing behind it, it will be difficult. So as a service designer, you always have to think about the complexity, the interconnectivity, and the different actors within a system who need to be involved and engaged in order to make transformation happen. This is a process. Um, it's a, a bit close to the double diamond of the British, uh, UK Design Council. But it uh, definitely underlines that if you do a project, you need to prepare that project. You cannot just jump into an exploration, the discovery. You have to make sure you have to, the right people on board. You have to make sure you have framed the project in an appropriate way, not too big and not too small, considering the complexity, but not drowning in the complexity. So all these things need to be, need to be done. And then you go into the exploration, the deep dive, where you open up, try to learn, try to understand as much as possible in order to then define what is the opportunity area? What is it that you want to focus on? In order to then open up again uh, divergent thinking, as many ideas as possible, co-create with the stakeholders in order to then conceptualize and bring it into a shape that is a feasible um, service model. And prototype it, test it, iterate it, improve it, and implement it. And that is very important from my perspective in service design, implementation is part of the process. Um, it is not enough to make a nice storyboard or to create a nice user journey, to draw pretty maps. No, you have to have the implementation in the back of your mind because it is so important that you have the right decision makers and the right stakeholders with you, working with you, going step by step in order to make implementation possible. And as designers, we don't want to work for the drawer, right? We don't want to have a nice concept that ends in the drawer, drawer closed, that was it. We want it to come alive. Okay, and there are some key principles for service design. It is holistic. You really try to zoom out and understand the journey of people, in, you know, before the service takes place, after the service takes place, see the big picture. It is uh, interdisciplinary. It cro crosses silos, and many service organizations are organized in a Tayloristic way. They are organized in silos. You have the marketing department, you have the sales department, you have the uh, service delivery, service management, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the user has an experience that goes across all these departments and across the different channels. So it's an analog experience and a digital experience, and those have to be synchronized. It's life-centered, and I find that quite important. I mean, you all have a background, I assume, in human-centered design, and we were all very proud for many decades that design is human-centered. For the last, uh, let's say, almost 10 years, we have been critically reflecting on that. With human-centered design, we have created a lot of destructive and exploitive 
um, uh, solutions that do not respect the planet and that do not respect that there is other stakeholders besides humans. And um, nowadays we are trying hard with every project to think beyond the human, to think what impact does what we do have on the planet, on the life? How can we make sure that other stakeholders are at the table and not only the human stakeholders? In some countries of this world, they have given uh, the, the rights to rivers, for example, so that the river is a stakeholder and whatever decisions is being made, the river is sitting at the table and raising its voice, claiming interest of the river. It's just an example, but we should be doing that. We should have these non-human stakeholders and we should give them a voice because it's the only planet we have and we need to make sure that uh, we don't destroy it more than we already have. Service design is co-creative, so you are not the, the lones, lonesome superstar that uh, sits in the, in the studio and comes up with a beautiful solution. No, you have to make your hands dirty and you have to work with those people that are involved. You have to listen to them. You have to include their ideas. You have to trust in their, in their competency, in their knowledge. So it's a co-creative process and as a service designer, you will facilitate, you will create workshops, you will be really working closely with humans. It's visual, so you translate ideas into visual evidence that can be prototypes, it can be sketches, it can be videos, it can be anything that brings a not yet existing future to life. And that's what this service design approach is about. We want people to, to see not yet existing futures and to be enthusiastic about them, about wanting change, about you know, not being afraid of change, but say, oh, wow, that looks great, we want that. Service design is radical. It tends to reframe problem statements, question the existing ex ex assumptions about uh, k systems, and that's something you learn during service design education, to not take a briefing as a truth, but to question the briefing, to question the assumptions that are behind the briefing, and to co-create the briefing with your clients. And last but not least, uh, service design is more and more data-driven and embraces in, uh, artificial intelligence. I think lots of the services that we consume today are created by bots, by artificial intelligence, and we need to include that systematically uh, into our design process. Okay, so that was just a little side uh, step to um, what is service design. Service design and the public sector have been working together ever since I started. And um, this was one of the first publications ever on service design, besides the one that I did with Ezio Mancini and uh, Michael Erlhoff in 1997. This was in 2005, and uh, it was um, supported by PricewaterhouseCoopers, Engine, a service design agency, and it was created by Demos. And it was the first publication really on what good can service design bring to the public sector? It's 20 years now. You can still download the uh, publication for free. It's really nice and it introduces like these basic terms of personas, uh, understanding who are our users, journey maps, emotional journey maps, what are the expectations and what are then the experiences and where is the gap between expectations and experiences. It, it introduces also the workshops for co-creation and prototyping. 2014, the UK government um, has the uh, service design manual in place. Already in 2013, they announced that the whole process of digitalization of the UK government would be done through the process of service design which means that it is not some, some software engineer who designs the digital solutions. No, it is done with the people who are supposed to use these digital solutions. And that was radically new. And sometimes even today it is still radically new. There is still too often um, too little dialogue with the end user and with those that are involved in a service, in a digital service, when creating it. But the UK government made this a policy. So everybody had to follow it. And they described the different roles and what that means for the different roles within the government. What does the service manager have to do with service design? What does the content designers have to do with it? And the designers in general, plus the software engineer. 
So you can also still find that and the role descriptions and everything. And today, I think it's about 2,000 um, designers working for the UK gov government, uh, some of them service designers, some called UX designers. Uh, but it's really a huge initiative to use design for yeah, citizen-centered public services. Then uh, 2016 and 17, we found that there is so much going on and we published two books on public sector service design and health sector service design. And it was really interesting because we found the impact service design is having in these domains. It's really quite big in the process of digitalization. You all know what a Trojan horse is. And I mentioned it earlier with uh, um, uh, Trojan horse and dark matters. Through digitalization, you can bring service design in an organization because public sector has to do digitalization. So they ask for design support. And if the designer is smart, the designer or the design team, they will not translate a bad analog service into a bad digital service. They will take the opportunity to reframe the way the service is being delivered to redefine the journey that the user of the service is going through and to maybe combine things in a totally different way, drop things that are no longer necessary. So digitalization is a great opportunity to radically redesign public sector services. Stakeholder engagement. In most governments all over the world, they talk about, well, yeah, we want our citizens to, uh, to collaborate with us, but they don't talk to us. We do something, they don't come. Um, so often it's the service designer who is helping the government, the public sector to create activities where collaboration takes place, where the stakeholder engagement is really happening. And I will show you very few examples in a little while. Capacity building. Service design is invited into public sector organizations to train the public servants to use service design themselves so that the naturally a public, uh, public servant would talk to the citizens before doing something, would listen to them, would build a prototype and test it. So there are many, very many basic things that the organization can do without the help of a professional service designer if they are educated that way. So service design helps to create change in an organization. I think in most countries, due to the fact that the public sector is about stability, there is a lot of hierarchy. There is a lot of control mechanisms. There is a lot of fear also, making mistakes. And through the service design approach, we can start to question hierarchies. Does it always have to be the, the head of the department who has the say? Shouldn't it be more a collaborative project? We can create invitations to fail we can create even fun when working. And I think that is maybe one of the most important things, service design processes can be really fun. You work with your hands, you think with your hands, you experiment, you try out stuff that is new. So it is about change. And it is about service design and bringing it on a strategic level. Because we all know public sector changes with politics. New elections, new direction, new people, <coughs> what happened to all the achievements we've made. So only if you succeed in bringing the design principles in the top level of the, of the uh, government, then there is a good chance that it will survive and that it will, that it will be a way to work, not only during one period of a, of a government. And many countries all over the world have brought design and service design on that top strategic level. I'll just go through that quickly. Scotland, they have these uh, design principles that every organizational unit within the public sector of Scotland is supposed to apply. Irish government, beautiful, 10 principles which they have co-created uh, throughout a period of one year um, and they published them in 2022. Then they worked for another year to publish at the end of 2023 the action plan for designing better public services. Because principles are nice. You can put a poster on the wall and you have a booklet on your table, but how do you bring principles to life? And that was the question that the Irish government has worked on for one year uh, last year. And now they are really pushing service design and design into the organization. 
German government, even the German government has some service standards and some you know, ways how to co-create services with the citizens. Yes, and this, this is me, and um, it looks Chinese, it is Chinese. <laughs> I'm on the stage last year in uh, Shanghai with the mayor of the city of Shanghai, with the head of the Tongji University and a couple of other uh, big shots who have created the service design initiative Shanghai. So they have decided that service design will be the way to make public services better in Shanghai. It empowers government services. It offers more transparent and efficient government processes, as well as more humane and convenient service touch points. It increases people's participation in government affairs and satisfaction with the government, enhancing interaction and building trust, etc. So these are attempts to really push it forward. And we see that there is a growing demand for service design in public sector all over the world. But are we really preparing the students properly for these opportunities? Yes, in some programs we are. I mean, there are very dedicated service design and public sector programs, as I said, at Sapienza University, uh, at Politecnico Milano, at my own master program, it's about um, social and public innovation, etc., etc. But I still think that we need to have a close look on how can we really prepare the students of service design programs or other design programs to provide a valuable input to the transformation of the public sector. So I had the opportunity to um, work on a research sabbatical on this amazing topic, how to public sector. Uh, so how can we create impactful collaborations between universities and the public sector. Because it is very often through the universities that service design is entering the public sector. And uh, we need to make these collaborations successful and we need to make them scale. So during the period of February to August last year, I had, we had a, um, a quantitative survey uh, with um, approximately 70 universities worldwide that have service design programs and we have approximately 40 some qualitative interviews with experts in the field of service design and public sector in the university field. And we found there's a lot going on. I think this is already a nice little map. If you are at a university and you are considering to you know, approach your public sector for collaboration or if you are in the public sector and are considering to collaborate with the university, where are the opportunities? And on the bottom line, you find opportunities where basically students individually work on projects with the public sector. That can be internships, it can be BA and MA thesis, it can be PhD uh, programs. And then in the second line, you find programs where, uh, or formats where um, groups of students work with the public sector, either short term, like in little sprints, or medium term that can be six to eight week projects or even long term where over many years there's collaboration agreements between the university and the public sector. So on all these formats, we found formats where the staff of the university is mainly engaged and that is often projects where there's horizon funding or other EU fundings or municipalities that are funding projects and they are often owned by the research labs, by the staff of the university, because only that way you can guarantee the continuity and the consistency as opposed to changing student teams. And uh, yeah, so that, there's quite a big amount of work going on. And last but not least, we found many ways where universities explicitly develop programs to educate the public sector in service design. And that can be uh, certificate programs, but it can also be uh, degree programs where the pub public servants bring their own projects into the, into the university program and uh, work on that uh, while learning what service design is and how it can impact the public sector. So that's kind of like an, an overview of the types of collaboration. And um, I will show you two or three examples, just so that you, you see what, what impact can this kind of university public sector collaboration achieve. And I'm going to start in Oulu. Who of you has ever been in Oulu? <laughs> it's, you have been? Really, let's talk in coffee break. 
<laughs> I, really, I really enjoyed Oulu, and it has a um, um, uh, um, university hospital, and uh, that university hospital is in charge of a huge region. I mean, Finland, and specifically Lapland, is, it's, it's so big. And uh, you cannot have a hospital in every little region. So they have a 900-kilometer outreach. And I, I think in 2018, they decided that they need to radically innovate the hospital. They want to become the world's smartest hospital. Hmm? You see all that, smart facilities, smart technology, et cetera, et cetera, uh, socially smart, multidisciplinary. And in order to get there, they had these clear objectives that it's not only about modern facilities and modern technology, but it's about understanding what do people really need. And reframing the journey of a, of, a, of a hospital, that the hospital is not only relevant for the moment somebody gets to the hospital until they get out, but that the health journey is bigger. And if you want to have efficient hospital services, you might want to include everything that happens before and that ha happens after you have been on the, in the hospital. So where does now the student come into the game? A master student of the University of Lapland, um, and you know Satu, I mean, it's a great program, um, did workshops. They collaborated uh, through 400 workshops uh, with all the different representatives of the hospital, from patients to doctors to administrators to technicians to nurses to whoever is involved. And they did observational walks in these workshops so that, that everybody would get a sense of what's good, what's bad, what would we imagine, what would we dream differently if we could redesign it. And of course, they started to map different options. They um, really you know, created the hospital of the future uh, and, of course, played a lot. But they also prototyped it then and tested it in the real environment to see how do these new processes work? What do we expect from facilities for the future? And they even had some uh, interesting VR um, projects where they created the project, uh, the hospital, and walked through the hospital uh, with VR glasses to see what does it feel like in this virtual reality. So it was a process of one year, and that student from Lapland University facilitated all these workshops and started to make sense out of the learnings in these workshops, because that is the most difficult part. Collecting post-its uh, is one thing, but translating these post-its into something that makes sense for the whole system. Um, yeah, so um, now the first three units of the hospital have been built, um, and uh, the hospital management is totally convinced of the service design approach, saying it has saved us so much money uh, by not building something and then realizing, oh, uh, it doesn't quite work, but in prototyping it, testing it, iterating, changing it, and then implementing it. Yeah, so that is a, a great, that's Timu, Timu from um, uh, Rovanimi, and Ro Ro Rovanimi is where the uh, University of Lapland is located. And he works with Satu Ruanami, Ruanimi. Uh, she is a full-time service designer at the uh, hospital. So I think that's quite impressive, you know, what can be done in the master, in the master thesis. And I would like to show you another one. Uh, Rachel, you already know it. Um, very interesting research question of a master student of mine. Uh, how can we turn shit into gold? Well, it's interesting. And it's not absurd. Because when you look at that, you understand the system of how phosphate rock, that is a rare material, goes into fertilizers, and through the fertilizers goes into our food, and through the food goes into our stomach, and through that goes into the fecus, which then goes into the toilet, which is then usually separated, and the valuable resources are being burned. Dot. It's a limited resource, it's very expensive, and we just flush it down the drain, and then it's gone. So what could we do? We could create a cycle huh? where uh, we rescue all that fecus and re tra tra transform it into something new, into fertilizer, for example. Now, I have to say the, the mm, scientific uh, background for all this was already there when my master student, Anastasia, started to work on the project. So dry toilets exist. It is also totally clear how you can transform the fecus into 
uh, fertilizer. Um, all the legal stuff is clear because there are strong regulations. There's other things in our FACOS, not only phosphate rock, um, and very clear uh, regulations on how has it be separate to be separated to make sure that we don't have f fertilizer um, that is already spoiled. So, but it was not put in place. So scientific insight was there on all these different places, but it was not being put together. And that was then the objective of that master thesis. Um, and the most important thing for it was service design approach to build a network, a network of actors. And uh, Anastasia has then kind of clustered these actors who are the passive actors, who are the active actors, who are the negative and the positive ones in order to then work with the positive active and the positive passive in order to then hopefully pull the negative people also into the system. And she did many different things. She had very playful approaches that she played with the administration in Cologne uh, because it's the administration that is responsible for these huge decisions about how is, you know, uh, toilets being designed in the public space. Uh, and she played with the Abfallwirtschaft, that is the um, uh, public institute to, for garbage removal. Anyway, she, she made a lot of interventions to create awareness and sensitivity for the relevance of the problem. And I, I'm cutting it short here. Uh, last year in November, the first, um, holy shit, the first public toilet um, was uh, opened. So her master thesis uh, finished with the design of the toilet, of the house, and, and with a network of, um, of allies. Uh, and the city of Cologne then said, we want to be the first city in the world that has only dry toilets in the public sector and that does a 100% recycling po process for the FACOS. I mean, that was the result of a, of a master thesis. She has now founded a startup and she is uh, building the system and as I said, city of Cologne is now step by step opening one of these toilets after the other. That's the mayor opening the toilet. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is, uh, says hot shit, heiser sh scheiß, hot shit. And this is the, um, the partner in the system that does the transportation of the um, content of the dry toilets um, and brings it into the recycling process. So it's a really big system and it's fun huh? and it's sustainable and it's a service. Master thesis. Okay, so student projects, just to get, create some hunger uh, to do these kind of things. I'm just, some of them I will just oh, touch lightly. This is a rather old project. I think it was already done in 2007 in a collaboration between the city of New York, um, the city bank, and Parsons New School. And they tackled together the challenge, um, how do we redesign the, the tax services for um, people from the lower income uh, group? Lower income often means lower education. Lower education usually means that people are afraid of doing their tax declaration. And that usually means that they lose money that they could get refunded from government. So there is a lot of money lost because those people do not make their tax declaration in January of each year. And that was the challenge for, the, for, for this project, to create a service that empowers uh, low income and low education people have a really easy way um, to do their tax declaration. And it was implemented, uh, you can watch it on YouTube. Tallinn, Estonia. I was there last year in my research project because they have a service design program and I just stumbled into the presentation of a student project where they had worked for seven weeks with a prison. And they, they tried to understand what kind of problems are the, the inmates facing when transitioning from prison to back in society. And uh, they had lots and lots of interviews with the different stakeholders. They had very few interviews with the inmates because there is also many ethical um, problems um, involved when you do service design in the social sector. When you work with a, with a vulnerable target group like inmates, um, you have to be careful that you don't create expectations or hopes for something that should be changing and you cannot 
you know, you, you cannot guarantee that anything will happen. So you have to be very careful on, you know, what you do and what kind of expectations you raise. So they did some interviews with the inmates, but it was basically secondary research that they were able to do. But they came up with a very, very cool insight that the, the supervisor, the inmate has in the hospital, is cut by law when the inmate leaves the hospital because they want them to have no contact to the hospital environment anymore. From the perspective of the inmates and from, you know, um, also social psychology, etc., they said it, it would be much better if the same person that had been supervising the inmate while he was under arrest afterwards, because there is a trust relationship, there is a knowledge about each other. So something very, very simple to be changed, and I'm not sure if it did happen, but at that presentation, uh, the representatives from the prison said, we will do it. We will make a prototype, we will try it, and we will see in how far that has a positive imp impact on the re-socialization of the inmates. Dublin, Ireland. A uh, short uh, a project um, that was done by uh, two students, and they worked with an emergency ambulance trying to understand uh, what are the biggest issues, and one of the biggest issues in emergency ambulance is time. <laughs> and they found that throughout the process of somebody being delivered to the hospital into the emergency room and uh, the, the surgery starting, there was like four times when data needed to be um, data needed to be collected or data needed to be compared, and there was a lot of loss of time due to the fact that there were different vessels for the data of the patient. And the students created a system to have all the data in one spot accessible for all the different emergency caretakers, and they won the service design award with that. So they did a lot of observation, workshops, interviews, and in the end, that was the solution, a very simple um, digital frame that would have the information about the patient in the, um, in the um, ward at the different... Okay. okay, so now I'm going to skip that one because... I'm running out of time. Let me see. So, okay. I have to show you this one very quickly. Helsinki, Alto University. They work in a long term partnership with the city of Helsinki on. Uh huh. Yes. Library. They used service design to create the public library, the new public library of Helsinki, and they did workshops with the citizens. They did uh, different kinds of um, stalls where the citizens could come and, and bring their, their needs. This is a screenshot from the website of the Oulu, uh, Udi uh, University. This is the university, how it came out. So it's a beautiful architecture, but the architecture is only one component. The most interesting thing is really what is the reason of being for a library in a time where people do not read that many books anymore? So what's the reason of being for a library? What kind of services does it provide? And this library provides yeah, knowledge, skills, stories. You can do everything there. You can use sewing machines, you have uh, VR glasses, you, have, uh, you can even rent um, theater tickets. Why rent books if you can rent a theater ticket? So it's a really uh, great place to, to live culture. And uh, I'm not, so if you ever go to Helsinki, make sure to visit the library. Yeah, that's all in the Helsinki library, a space to just hang around and nobody asks you, what are you doing here? You can, if you're cold, you can just sit in the library and nobody will ask, where is your library card? So it's a welcoming place and many people now, I think everybody in Helsinki is super proud of that library and I think it's because it is a service design project. Okay, so is it really two waves crashing against each other when we bring the innovators of design and the conservators of public sector together? Obviously not. There is many examples on, on great projects and of course um, there is also lots of different ways of impact service design can have on the public sector but also on the students up to job perspectives. So many of those students that were in these projects started to then work for the public sector. So many jobs around service design are starting to, to come in place. But there are also many challenges. You know? And throughout the whole process, knowledge transfer, uh, how do we make sure that the public sector learns something and the student learns something. Uh, complexity overload, how do I tailor a project so it's not too small and not too big 
how do I consider these ethical concerns, as I have just mentioned, working with vulnerable co communities, um, having a life-centered design, commitment and engagement of the public sector. We found that often it's like, you know, public sector is used to commission a task and then they want a result. But service design is a co-creative process, so it asks for engagement, for involvement, how do you get that managed? Two different working cultures are meeting, so throughout the project you have to start systematically handle these um, challenges. And whoop, there are some and I'm doing this really fast because you will be able, if you are interested, to look into this uh, very soon because we are publishing this as an open source um, publication. Also with a toolbox that everybody will be able to access. And uh, uh, thanks again to Sapienza uh, for having um, tested the prototype of that toolbox. A toolbox that empowers um, university uh, partners to prepare and conduct uh, the project and to overcome all these challenges. So. Publication will be shared, let's say, autumn. Uh, and uh, if you want to stay tuned, you might want to connect to the Service Design Network. You can become a free member, and then you will get all the news, what is being published, what events are taking place. This is the next event on 12th of April. It's created by the Young Talent Board. It's the, the young professionals of the Service Design community who create this event for the young professionals and for potential employers of service designers. So that is on April 12th. And yes, this is where you can uh, get your free membership. There's also, of course, paid memberships, but no, take the free membership to start with, and you will be always um, informed about what's going on. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Birgit, it's very inspiring. I don't know if there are some questions. Okay. Okay. Hello, Birgit, um, thanks a lot for your presentation, really, really inspiring, and I'm also thankful, I'm glad that you mentioned Life Centered. And uh, my question is, um, and this was a reflection I was having when you were presenting about the homeless people. And um, I know about some experiences here in Spain, in Aragon, with the public services. They've been spending time, like, you know, creating social cohesion and things that need to happen in the neighborhoods. But when the government has changed, um, they've started dismantling um, some of these things. So I would say, what challenges um, in your experience um, are faced when government changes and how can we make certain things last across different governments?
Hi, uh, it's Marco Mason, uh, Associate Professor, School of Design, Rotumbi University. Thank you for engaging me with your presentation and very kind of useful example. And my question is about the solution space. At the beginning, you show a slide, uh, kind of double diamond diagram. And um, I'm doing research with museums in the UK. I'm interviewing, observing museum practitioner user design, thinking service design. And um, many times happened that when I, we discuss and show like the double diamond and we talk about the solution space, they describe that, that space not like a convergence of a process, like a, a final point, but more a point in which you open many opportunities. So they are, during the interview, there kind of some criti critics about the convergence of the kind of, there is not just a solution like the toilet, it seemed that open many other possibilities. So talking about the final solution is sometimes is, 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 is not easy. It is not kind of so that final point. I don't know how to explain. Does it make sense? <laughs> Uh, yeah, hi. I, it seems like if you have a question to ask, you need to sit in this part of the room. So, <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, thank you for your presentation. Um, a question like with this idea of pulling in multiple stakeholders and stuff, have you had much experience or, or what do you have to say in terms of involving philanthropic organizations? Uh, not necessarily government, not necessarily kind of community entities, but more kind of, and like, yeah, about even like the development of projects and how can you be inclusive in developing a project when working with philanthropic organizations and, and, and such. Sure. Okay. So, yeah. I, first of all, thank you for your quite inspiring lecture. It was great. 
So it's quite appealing in bringing so many people to, to it for sure. I have some, we have also some uh, uh, service uh, design projects in Portugal with uh, homeless people, with migrants people, with prison uh, and so on, so a lot of similar projects. So, And uh, one of my issues in this kind of project is that the, it's quite time expanding. Because you have, as you said, and I fully agree, a trust relation that probably is the, the more difficult to get. And my question about that, how you used to surpass the issue, because in most cases you are dealing and working and co-creating with people that have their own traumas, their own time. And uh, so how you bring them to, to the table to say, we just want to hear you and help you in the sense that what you need it, know what I intend to do or something to... So. Okay, so uh, we have to bring the stakeholders from the public sector into the projects, build a trust relationship, a shared understanding of what service design is, and that of course is much easier if you have a continuous relationship. So in Cologne we have now the fifth year of collaboration, every semester I'm having one student project and they have hired by now four of my, um, of my uh, graduates, and so there's a, like, a good relationship. Uh, and the, be the more you can continue such collaborations, the better the quality of the collaboration gets. Now, when it comes to the, to the citizens or other stakeholders, there I can say, um, as designers, we have to be much aware of not exploiting people. Uh, and uh, I, I think I, I have learned a lot throughout the last 30 years, uh, many things I didn't know when I started. Uh, today, I would maybe be a little bit more careful with some of the projects that I have done. Mm. I can really recommend uh, to read K.A. McCarsha. Uh, she has written a great book on how to avoid exploiting uh, your stakeholders through co-creation. Because as designers, we do tend to have a bit of an arrogance sometimes. We go into an organization and think, oh my God, we are so creative, we are so cool, and we'll do it all. And we have to be much more careful in asking, how can we help an organization? In asking, you know, under which circumstances would somebody be willing to, to share their thoughts, their feelings, their, their interests? And when do we have to pay for it? Um, because specifically when it comes to private sector, uh, it, it's, it's work that we should be paying also for people that, you know, it's market research, huh? it's, it's time that they give to us. And unless that they have a direct benefit from it through the outcome, I think we always have to, to, to consider uh, payment, contracts, and we have to be very modest and very careful. We cannot be the black turtleneck uh, designer jumping into a system and thinking we know it all. We don't. These people in public sector and social sector have done a lot of amazing work, um, and we can maybe help them to, to reframe some things, to see things differently, but they will only listen to us if they feel respected for what they have been doing over many, many decades. And I think that's a big challenge. Because, uh, just <laughs> only because we have a lunch time, and then we have to do this. So more I fully agree with you because most cases we're just learning with others, right? Um, but in l related to that, you present this kind of approach and uh, as a radical one, radical. And I have the perspective this because of this, and because we are dealing with every and respecting the end users and then so on. It's not so radical innovation what we can do, but in fact increment, incremental one, because we really want to achieve what is needed. So it's a provocation, <laughs> what you think. I think it can be very radical if we start to reframe the problem. Uh, for example, with the homeless pro uh, project. I did that 30 years ago. Um, nowadays, I would say, a real radical approach to it would be housing first. And that is an initiative that's now all over the world, saying we should not put band-aids on wooden legs. We should make sure uh, that homeless people get a home. Uh, and uh, in our society, it should be possible that everybody has a, has a bed to be sleeping in. And yes, I mean, maybe you have to do something like the survival station in parallel, but the long-term goal should be uh, to fight for the right of everybody to have a home. 
And I think in that sense you can be radical and at the same time also help to, to fix problems uh, without, with, uh, while knowing that this is not the final solution. So I'm sorry, but I have to say that uh, this was an amazing uh, final, not final because the, the, the conference continues in the afternoon, but the last uh, keynote speech is very amazing. And this is just my very uh, final uh, comments. I think, I believe, I, I, I am chairing a, a Master of Science in Product and Service Design. And I'm convinced that service design is the only design that can be build a real sustainable future. And therefore, please, all of you, not depends if you are in architecture fields, product fields, uh, communication fields, uh, work on service design because it's our future. Thank you to Birgit. To start it, uh, to work on this. Okay, we continue on lunch. Yes. Bye.